At 12.52 a.m., Richard Todd landed, with other paras dropping all around him. Like poet earlier, Todd could not get oriented, because he could not see the steeple of the Ranville Church. Tracer bullets were flying across the DZ, so he unbuckled and made for a nearby woods, where he hoped to meet other paras and get his bearings. He got them from Howard's whistle. Major Nigel Taylor, commanding a company of the 7th Battalion of the 5th Brigade, was also confused. The first man he ran into was an officer who had a bugler with him. The two had dropped earlier, with Poet and the Pathfinders. Their job was to find the rendezvous in Ranville, then start blowing on the bugle the regimental call of the Somerset Light Infantry. But the officer told Taylor, I've been looking for this damned rendezvous for three quarters of an hour, and I can't find it. They ducked into a woods, where they found Colonel Pine Coffin, the battalion commander. He too was lost. They got out their maps, put a flashlight on them, but still could not make out their location. Then they too heard Howard's whistle. Knowing where Howard was did not solve all Pine Coffin's problems. Fewer than 100 of his more than 350-man force had gathered around him. He knew that Howard had the bridges, but as Nigel Taylor explains, he also knew that the Germans had a propensity for immediate counterattack. Our job was to get down across that bridge, to the other side, we were the only battalion scheduled to go on that side west of the canal. So Pine Coffin's dilemma was, should he move off with insufficient men to do the job, or wait for the battalion to form up? He knew he had to get off as quickly as possible to relieve John Howard. At about 1.10am, Pine Coffin decided to set off at double time for the bridges, leaving one man to direct the rest of his battalion when it came up. In Ranville, meanwhile, Major Schmidt had decided he had best investigate all the shooting going on at his bridges. He grabbed one last plateful of food, a bottle of wine, his girlfriend and his driver, summoned his motorcycle escort, and roared off for the river bridge. He was in a big, open Mercedes-Benz. As they sped past his girlfriend's house, she screamed that she wanted to be let out. Schmidt ordered the driver to halt, gave her a goodbye pat, and sped on. The Mercedes came on so fast that Sweeney's men did not have a chance to fire at it before it was already on the bridge. They did open up on the motorcycle that was trailing the car, hit it broadside, and sent it and its driver skidding off into the river. Sweeney, on the west bank, fired his sten at the speeding Mercedes, riddling it and causing it to run straight off the road. Sweeney's men picked up the driver and Major Schmidt, both badly wounded. In the car they found wine, plates of food, lipstick, stockings, and ladies' lingerie. Sweeney had the wounded Schmidt and his driver put on stretchers and carried over to Dr. Vaughan's aid post. By the time he arrived at the post, Schmidt had recovered from his initial shock. He began screaming, in perfect English, that he was the commander of the garrison at the bridge, that he had let his Führer down, that he was humiliated and had lost his honour, and that he demanded to be shot. Alternatively, he was yelling that, you British are going to be thrown back, my Führer will see to that. You're going to be thrown back into the sea. Vaughan got out a syringe of morphine and jabbed him in his butt with it, then set about dressing his wounds. The effect of the morphine, Vaughan reports, was to induce him to take a more reasonable view of things, and after ten minutes of haranguing me about the futility of the Allied attempt to defeat the master race, he relaxed. Soon he was profusely thanking me for my medical attentions. Howard confiscated Schmidt's binoculars. Schmidt's driver, a 16-year-old German, had had one leg blown off. The other leg was just hanging. Vaughan removed it with his scissors. Within a half hour, the boy was dead. By 1.15 a.m., Howard had completed his defensive arrangements at the canal bridge. He had Wood's platoon with him at the east end, along with the sappers. He had organised the sappers into a platoon that he was holding in reserve near his CP. On the west side, Brotheridge's platoon held the café and the ground around it, while Smith's platoon held the bunkers to the right. Smith was in command of both platoons, but he was growing increasingly groggy due to the loss of blood and the intense pain in his knee, which had started to stiffen. Fox was up ahead, toward the T-junction, with Thornton carrying the only working Piat. The paras of the 7th Battalion were on their way, but their arrival time, and in what strength, was problematical. Howard could hear the tanks. He was desperate to establish radio communication with Fox, but could not. Then he saw a tank swing slowly, ever so slowly, toward the bridge. 
its great cannon sniffing the air like the trunk of some prehistoric monster. And it wasn't long before we could see a couple of them about twenty-five yards apart, moving very, very slowly, quite obviously not knowing what to expect when they got down to the bridges. Everything was now at stake and hung in the balance. If the Germans retook the canal bridge, they would then drive on to overwhelm Sweeney's platoon at the river bridge. There they could set up a defensive perimeter, bolstered by tanks, so strong that the 6th Airborne Division would find it difficult, perhaps impossible, to break through. In that case the division would be isolated, without anti-tank weapons to fight off von Luck's armour. It sounds overly dramatic to say that the fate of the more than 10,000 fighting men of the 6th Airborne depended on the outcome of the forthcoming battle at the bridge, but we know from what happened to the 1st Airborne in September 1944 at Arnhem that that was in fact exactly the case. Beyond the possible loss of the 6th Airborne, it stretches matters only slightly to state that the fate of the invasion as a whole was at risk on John Howard's bridge. We have the testimony of von Luck himself on this subject. He contends that if those bridges had been available to him, he could have crossed the Orne waterways and thrown his regiment into the late afternoon D-Day counterattack. That attack by the 192nd Regiment of 21st Panzer almost reached the beaches. Von Luck feels that had his regiment also been in that attack, 21st Panzer would have surely driven to the beaches. A panzer division loose on the beaches, amidst all the unloading going on, could have produced havoc with unimaginable results. Enough speculation. The point has been made. A great deal was at stake up there at the T-junction. Fittingly, as so much was at stake, the battle at the bridge at 1.30am on D-Day provided a fair test of the British and German armies of World War II. Each side had advantages and disadvantages. Howard's opponents were the company commanders in Benouville and Japour. Like Howard, they had been training for more than a year for this moment. They had been caught by surprise, but the troops at the bridge had been their worst troops, not much of a loss. In Benouville, the 1st Panzer Engineering Company of the 716th Infantry Division, and in Lepore, the 2nd Engineers, were slightly better quality troops. The whole German military tradition, reinforced by orders, compelled them to launch an immediate counter-attack. They had the platoons to do it with, and the armoured vehicles. What they did not have was a sure sense of the situation, because they kept getting conflicting reports. Those conflicting reports were one of the weaknesses of the German army in France. They came about because of the language difficulties. The officers could not understand Polish or Russian, the men could not understand German. The larger problem was the presence of so many conscripted foreigners in their companies, which in turn was a reflection of Germany's most basic problem in World War II. Germany had badly overreached itself. Its population was insufficient to provide all the troops required on the various fronts. Filling the trenches along the Atlantic Wall with what amounted to slaves from Eastern Europe looked good on paper, but in practice such soldiers were nearly worthless. On the other hand, German industry did get steady production out of slave labour. Germany had been able to provide its troops with the best weapons in the world, and in abundance. By comparison, British industrial output was woefully inferior, in both quantity and quality. But although his firearms were inferior, Howard was commanding British troops, every one of them from the United Kingdom, and every man among them a volunteer who was superbly trained. They were vastly superior to their opponents, Except for Fox and the crippled Smith, Howard was without officers, but he personally enjoyed one great advantage over the German commanders. He was in his element, in the middle of the night, fresh, alert, capable of making snap decisions, getting accurate reports from his equally fresh and alert men. The German commanders were confused, getting conflicting reports, tired and sleepy. Howard had placed his platoons exactly where he had planned to put them, with three on the west side to meet the first attacks, two in reserve on the east side, including the sappers, and one at the river bridge. Howard had seen to it that his anti-tank capability was exactly where he had planned to put it, right up at the T-junction. The German commanders, by way of contrast, were groping, hardly sure of where their own platoons were, unable to decide what to do. But, as noted, the Germans had the great advantage of badly outgunning Howard, they had a half dozen tanks to his zero. They had two dozen lorries and a platoon to fill each one, 
to Howard's six platoons and no lorries. They had artillery, a battery of 88 millimetres, while Howard had none. Howard did not even have gammon bombs. Hand-thrown grenades were of little or no use against a tank, because they usually bounced off and exploded harmlessly in the air. Bren and Sten guns were absolutely useless against a buttoned-down tank. The only weapon Howard had to stop those tanks was Sergeant Thornton's Piat gun. That gun, and the fact that he had trained D Company for precisely this moment, the first contact with tanks. He felt confident that Thornton was at the top of his form, totally alert, not the least bothered by the darkness or the hour, and that Thornton was fully proficient in the use of a Piat, that he knew precisely where he should hit the lead tank to knock it out. Others were not quite so confident. Sandy Smith recalls, hearing this bloody thing, feeling a sense of absolute terror, saying, my God, what the hell am I going to do with these tanks coming down the road? Billy Gray, who had taken up a position in an unoccupied German gun pit, remembers, then the tank came down the road. We thought that was it, you know, no way were we going to stop a tank. It was about 20 yards away from us because we were up on this little hillock, but it did give a sort of field of fire straight up the road. We fired up the road at anything we could see moving. Gray was tempted to fire at the tank. Most men in their first hour of combat would have done so. But, Gray says, paying a tribute to his training, I didn't fire at the tank. Gray, along with all Howard's men on the west side of the bridge, held fire. They did not, in short, reveal their positions, thus luring the tanks into the killing zone. Howard had expected the tanks to be preceded by an infantry reconnaissance patrol. That was the way he would have done it. But the Germans had neglected to do so. Their infantry platoons were following the two tanks. So the tanks rolled forward, ever so slowly, the tankers unaware that they had already crossed the front line. The first Allied company in the invasion was about to meet the first German counterattack. It all came down to Thornton and the German tankers. The tankers' visibility was such that they could not see Thornton, half buried as he was under that pile of equipment. Thornton was about 30 yards from the T-junction, and, he says, I don't mind admitting it. I was shaking like a bloody leaf. He could hear the tank coming toward him. He fingered his Piat. The Piat actually is a load of rubbish, really, Thornton says today. The range is around about 50 yards and no more. You're a dead loss if you try to go farther. Even 50 yards is stretching it, very much so. Another thing is that you must never, never miss. If you do, you've had it, because by the time you reload the thing and cock it, which is a bloody chore on its own, Everything's gone. You're done. It's indoctrinated into your brain that you mustn't miss. Thornton had taken his position as close to the T-junction as he could get, because he wanted to shoot at the shortest possible distance. And sure enough, in about three minutes, this bloody great thing appears. I was more hearing it than seeing it in the dark. It was rattling away there, and it turned out to be a Mark IV tank coming along pretty slowly, and they hung around for a few seconds to figure out where they were only had two of the bombs with me. Told myself, you mustn't miss. Anyhow, although I was shaking, I took an aim and bang, off it went. The tank had just turned at the T-junction. I hit him round about right bang in the middle. I made sure I had him right in the middle. I was so excited and so shaking I had to move back a bit. Then all hell broke loose. The explosion from the Piat bomb penetrated the tank, setting off the machine gun clips, which started setting off grenades, which started setting off shells. As Glenn Gray points out in his book, The Warriors, one of the great appeals of war is the visual display of a battlefield, with red, green or orange tracers skimming about, explosions going off here and there, flares lighting up portions of the sky. But few warriors have ever had the opportunity to see such a display as that at the T-junction on D-Day. The din, the light show, could be heard and seen by paratroopers many kilometres from the bridge. Indeed, it provided an orientation, and thus got them moving in the right direction. When the tank went off, Fox took protection behind a wall. He explains, You couldn't go very far because whiz-bang a bullet or shell went straight past you, but finally it died down, and incredibly we heard this man crying out. Old Tommy Clare couldn't stand it any longer, and he went straight out up to the tank and it was blazing away, and he found the driver had got out of the tank still conscious, was laying beside it, but both legs were gone. He had been hit in the knees getting out, and Claire, who was always kind, he was an immensely strong fellow, 
Back in barracks, he once broke a man's jaws by just one blow for getting on his nerves. And Tommy hunched this poor old German on his back and took him to the first aid post. I thought it was useless, of course, but in fact, I believe the man lived. He did, but only for a few more hours. He turned out to be the commander of the first Panzer Engineering Company. The fireworks show went on and on. All told, it lasted for more than an hour, and it helped convince the German company commanders that the British were present in great strength. Indeed, the lieutenant in the second tank withdrew to Benouville, where he reported that the British had six-pounder anti-tank guns at the bridge. The German officers decided that they would have to wait until dawn and a clarification of the situation before launching another counter-attack. John Howard had won the Battle of the Night. Through the night, the lead tank smouldered, right across the T-junction, thus blocking movement between Benouville and Lepore and between Cannes and the coast. An argument can therefore be made that Sergeant Thornton had pulled off the single most important shot of D-Day, because the Germans badly needed that road. Thornton himself is impatient with any such talk. When I had completed my interview with him and had shut off the tape recorder, he remarked, Whatever you do in this book, don't go making me into a bloody hero. To which I could only think to reply, Sergeant Thornton, I don't make heroes. I only write about them. By the time the tank went up, at about 1.30am, Poet's men of the 5th Para Brigade, led by Pine Coffin's 7th Battalion, with Nigel Taylor's company leading the way, were double-timing toward the bridge, at less than one-third strength. The Paras knew they were late, because they thought from the fireworks that Howard was undergoing intensive attacks. But, as Taylor explains, it's very difficult to double in the dark, carrying a heavy weight on uneven ground. When they got on the road leading to the bridges, they ran into Brigadier Poet, who was headed back toward his CP in Ranville. Come on, Nigel, Poet called out to Taylor in his high-pitched voice. Double, double, double. Taylor rather thought the order superfluous, but in fact his chaps did break into a rather shambling run. Richard Todd was in the group. He recalls the paratrooper medical officer catching up with him, grabbing him by the arm and saying, Can I come with you? You see, I'm not used to this sort of thing. Todd says that the doctor was rather horrified because we passed a German who had had his head shot off, but his arms and legs were still waving about and strange noises were coming out of him, and I thought even the doctor was a bit turned over by that. Todd remembers thinking, as he was running between the river and the canal bridges, now we're really going into it, because there was a hell of an explosion and a terrific amount of firing, and tracers going in all directions. It really looked like there was a real fight going on. Major Taylor thought, oh Lord, I'm going to have to commit my company straight into battle on the trot. When 7th Battalion arrived at the bridge, Howard gave the leaders a quick briefing. The Paras then went across, Nigel Taylor's company moving out to the left, into Benouville, while the other companies moved right, into Lepore. Richard Todd took up his position on a knoll just below the little church in Lepore, while Taylor led his company to pre-arranged platoon positions in Benouville. Taylor recalls that, except for the tank exploding in the background, within the hour, everything was absolutely dead quiet. The Germans had hunkered down to await the outcome of the battle at the T-junction. A German motorcycle started up. The driver came around the corner, headed for the T-junction. Taylor's men were on both sides of the road, and they've been training for God knows how many years to kill Germans, and this is the first one they've seen. They all opened up. As the driver went into shock from the impact of a half dozen or more bullets, his big twin-engined BMW bike flipped over and came down on him. The throttle was stuck on full, and the bike was in gear. It was absolutely roaring its head off, and every time it hit the ground, the thing was bucking, shying about. The bike struck one of Taylor's men, causing injuries that later resulted in death, before someone finally got the engine shut off. It was about 2.30 a.m., at 3 a.m. Howard got a radio message from Sweeney, saying that Pine Coffin and his battalion headquarters were crossing the river bridge, headed toward the canal. Howard immediately started walking east, and met Pine Coffin halfway between the bridges. They walked back to the canal together, Howard telling Pine Coffin what had happened and what the situation was, so that by the time they arrived at the canal bridge, Pine Coffin was already in the picture. As he crossed the bridge, 
Pine Coffin queried Sergeant Thornton. Nodding toward the burning tank, the colonel asked, What the bloody hell's going on up there? It's only a bloody old tank going off, Thornton replied, but it is making an awful racket. Pine Coffin grinned. I should say so, he said. Then he turned left to make his headquarters on an embankment facing the canal, right on the edge of Benouville near the church. After unloading the horser he had flown in as Hash-2 glider pilot, Sergeant Boland went off exploring. He headed south, walking beside and below the towpath, and got to the outskirts of Caen. His may have been the deepest penetration of D-Day, although, as Boland points out, there were scattered British paras dropping all around him, and some of the paras possibly came down even closer to Caen. At any event, it would be some weeks before British and Canadian forces got that far again. Boland continues, I decided I had better go back because it was bloody dangerous, not from the Germans, but from bloody paras who were a bit trigger-happy. They'd landed all over the place, up trees, God knows where, and were very susceptible to firing at anybody coming from that direction. After establishing his identity by using the password, Boland led a group of paras back to the bridge. When he arrived, he saw Woolwork sitting on the bank. How are you, Jim? he asked. Woolwork looked past Boland, saw the paras, and went into a rocket. Where have you been till now? he demanded. We'd all thought you were on a 48-hour pass. The bloody war is over. The paras thought they were rescuing us, Boland says. We felt we were rescuing them. The arrival of the 7th Battalion freed D Company from its patrolling responsibilities on the West Bank and allowed Howard to pull his men back to the ground between the two bridges, where they were held as a reserve company. When Wally Parr arrived, he set to examining the anti-tank gun emplacement, which had been unmanned when the British arrived and unnoticed since. Parr discovered a labyrinth of tunnels under the emplacement. He got a flashlight, another private, and began exploring. He discovered sleeping quarters. There was nothing in the first two compartments he checked. In the third, he saw a man in bed, shaking violently. Parr slowly pulled back the blanket. There was this young soldier lying there in full uniform, and he was shaking from top to toe, absolutely shaking. Pa got him up with his bayonet, then took him up onto the ground and put him in the temporary prisoner of war cage. He returned to the gun pit, where he was joined by Billy Gray, Charlie Gardner and Jack Bailey. On his side of the bridge, across the road, Sergeant Thornton had persuaded Lieutenant Fox that there were indeed Germans still sleeping deep down in the dugouts. They set off together with a flashlight to find them. Thornton took Fox to a rear bunk room, opened the door, and shone his light on three Germans, all snoring, with their rifles neatly stacked in the corner. Thornton removed the rifles, then covered Fox with his sten while Fox shook the German in the top bunk. He snored on. Fox ripped off the blanket, shone his torch in the man's face, and told him to get up. The German took a long look at Fox. He saw a wild-eyed young man, dressed in a ridiculous smock, his face blackened, pointing a little toy gun at him. He concluded that one of his buddies was playing a small joke. He told Fox, in German, but in a tone of voice and with a gesture that required no translation, fuck off. Then he turned over and went back to sleep. It took the wind right out of my sails, Fox admits. Here I was, a young officer, first bit of action, first German I had seen close up, and giving him an order and receiving such a devastating response, well, it was a bit deflating. Thornton, meanwhile, got to laughing so hard he was crying. He collapsed on the floor, roaring with laughter. Fox looked at him. The hell with this, the lieutenant said to the sergeant. You take over. Fox went back up to ground level. Shortly thereafter, Thornton brought him a prisoner who spoke a bit of English. Thornton suggested that Fox might like to interrogate him. Fox began asking him about his unit, where other soldiers were located, and so on. But the German ignored his questions. Instead, he demanded to know, Who are you? What are you doing here? What is going on? Fox tried to explain that he was a British officer and that the German was a prisoner. The German could not believe it. Oh, come on, you don't mean... You can't. Well, how did you land? We didn't hear you land. I mean, where did you come from? Poor Fox suddenly realised that he was the one being interrogated and turned the proceedings back over to Thornton, but not before admiring photographs of the prisoner's family. 
Von Luck was furious. At 1.30 a.m. he received the first reports of British paratroopers in his area. He immediately put his regiment on full alert. Locally, he counted on his company commanders to launch their own counterattacks wherever the British had captured a position, but the bulk of the regiment he ordered assembled northeast of Caen. The assembly went smoothly enough, and by 3 a.m. von Luck had gathered his men and their tanks and their SPVs, altogether an impressive force. The officers and men were standing beside their tanks and vehicles, engines running, ready to go. But although von Luck had prepared for exactly this moment, knew where he wanted to go, in what strength, over what routes, with what alternatives, he could not give the order to go. Because of the jealousies and complexities of the German high command, because Rommel disagreed with Rundstedt, because Hitler was contemptuous of his generals and did not trust them to boot, the German command structure was a hopeless muddle. Without going into the details of such chaos, it suffices to note here that Hitler had retained personal control of the armoured divisions. They could not be used in a counter-attack until he had personally satisfied himself that the action was the real invasion. But Hitler was sleeping, and no one ever liked to wake him, and besides, the reports coming into the OKW were confused and contradictory, and in any case hardly alarming enough to suggest that this was the main invasion. A nighttime paratrooper drop might just be a diversion, so no order came to von Luck to move out. My idea, von Luck explained 40 years later while studying a map, was after I got more information about the parachute landings and the gliders, my idea was that a night attack would be the right way to counterattack, starting at three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning, before the British could organize their defenses, before their air force people could come, before the British Navy could hit us. We were quite familiar with the ground, and I think that we could have been able to get through to the bridges. Pointing at the map, he continued, I think we could have gotten through around here, even north around here, to cut Major Howard's men from the main body of the landings. And then, von Luck continues, the whole situation on the east side of the bridges would have been different. The paratroopers would have been isolated, and I would have had communications with the other half of the 21st Panzer Division. But von Luck could not act on his own initiative, so there he sat, a senior officer in an army that prided itself on its ability to counter-attack, a leader in one of the divisions Rommel most counted upon to lead the D-Day counter-attack, personally quite certain of what he could accomplish, his attack routes all laid out. There he sat, rendered immobile by the intricacies of the leadership principle in the Third Reich. The Gondre too were immobilized, inside their café. They were hiding in the cellar. Teresa, shivering in her nightdress, urged George to return to the ground floor and investigate. I am not a brave man, he later admitted, and I did not want to be shot, so I went upstairs on all fours and crawled to the first floor window. There I heard talk outside but could not distinguish the words, so I pushed open the window and peeped out cautiously. I saw in front of the café two soldiers sitting near my petrol pump with a corpse between them. Georges was seen by one of the paras. Vous civil? the soldier kept asking. Georges tried to assure him that he was indeed a civilian, but the man did not speak French and Georges, not knowing what was going on, did not want to reveal the fact that he understood English. He tried some halting German, but that got nowhere, and he returned to the cellar to await daylight and developments. At about 5 a.m., Sandy Smith's knee had stiffened to the point of near uselessness. His arm had swollen to more than twice normal size. His wrist was throbbing with pain. He approached Howard and said he thought he ought to go over to Vaughan's first aid post and have his wounds and injuries looked after. Must you go? asked Howard plaintively. Smith promised that he would be back in a minute. When he got to the post, Dr. Vaughan wanted to give him morphine. Smith refused. Vaughan said he could not go back to duty anyway, because he would be more of a nuisance than a help. Smith took the morphine. Thus, when Howard called for a platoon leader's meeting at his CP, just before dawn, the full weight of the officer loss he had suffered struck him directly. Brotheridge's hash, one platoon was being commanded by Corporal Kane, the sergeant was out of action and the lieutenant dead. Both Woods and Smith's Hash 2 and Hash 3 platoons were also commanded by corporals. The second in command, Brian Priday, and the Hash 4 platoon leader, Tony Hooper, had not been heard from. Only Hash 5, Fox, and Hash 6 platoons, 
Sweeney, had their full complement of officers and NCOs. There had been a dozen casualties total, plus two dead. Howard had not called his platoon leaders together to congratulate them on their accomplishment, but rather to prepare for the future. He went through various counter-attack routes and possibilities with them, in the event the Germans broke through the lines of the 7th Battalion. Then he told them to have everyone stand to until first light. At dawn, half the men could stand down and try to catch some sleep. As the sky began to brighten, the light revealed D Company in occupation of the ground between the two bridges. It had carried out the first part of its mission. The Germans wanted the bridges back, but their muddled command structure was hurting them badly. At 3 a.m. von Luck had ordered the 8th Heavy Grenadier Battalion, which was one of his forward units located north of Caen and on the west side of the Orne waterways, to march to Benouville and retake the bridge. But, as Lieutenant Werner Kortenhaus reports, despite its name, the 8th Heavy Grenadier Battalion had with it only its automatic weapons, some light anti-aircraft guns and some grenade launchers. No armour. Nevertheless, the Grenadiers attacked, inflicting casualties on Major Taylor's company and driving it back into the middle of Benouville. The Grenadiers then dug in and waited for the arrival of Panzers from 21st Panzer Division. Lieutenant Kortenhaus, who stood beside his tank, engine running, recalls his overwhelming thought over the last two hours of darkness. Why didn't the order to move come? If we had immediately marched, we would have advanced under cover of darkness. But Hitler was still sleeping, and the order did not come. Georges Gondré, in his cellar, welcomed the wonderful air of dawn coming up over the land. Through a hole in the cellar he could see figures moving about. I could hear no guttural orders, which I always associated with a German working party, Gondré later wrote. He asked Teresa to go to the hole and listen to the soldiers talk, to determine whether they were speaking German or not. She did so and presently reported that she could not understand what they were saying. Then Georges listened again, and my heart began to beat quicker for I thought I heard the words all right. Members of the 7th Battalion began knocking at the door. Gondre decided to go up and open it before it was battered down. He admitted two men in battle smocks, with smoking sten guns and coal-black faces. They asked in French whether there were any Germans in the house. He answered no, and took them into the bar, and thence, with some reluctance on their part, which he overcame with smiles and body language, to the cellar. There he pointed to his wife and two children. For a moment there was silence, Gondre wrote. Then one soldier turned to the other and said, It's all right, chum. At last I knew that they were English and burst into tears. Teresa began hugging and kissing the paratroopers, laughing and crying at the same time. As she kissed all the later arrivals too, by midday her face was completely black. Howard remembers that she remained like that for two or three days afterward, refusing to clear it off, telling everybody that this was from the British soldiers, and she was terribly proud of it. Forty years later, Madame Gondre remained the number one fan of the British 6th Airborne Division. No man who was there on D-Day has ever had to pay for a drink at her café since, and many of the participants have been back often. The Gondre were the first family to be liberated in France, and they were generous in expressing their gratitude ever after. Free drinks for the British airborne chaps began immediately upon liberation, as George went out into his garden and dug up 98 bottles of champagne that he had buried in June 1940, just before the Germans arrived. Howard describes the scene. There was a hell of a lot of cork popping went on, enough so that it was heard on the other side of the canal. Howard was on the cafe side of the bridge, consulting with Pine Coffin. The cafe had by then been turned into the battalion aid post. So, Howard says, by the time I got back I was told that everybody wanted to report sick at the aid post. Well, we stopped that lark, of course. Then Howard confesses, well, I didn't go back until I had had a sip, of course, of this wonderful champagne. A bit embarrassed, he explains, it really was something to celebrate. Shortly after dawn, the seaborne invasion began. The largest armada ever assembled, nearly 6,000 ships of all types, lay off the Norman coast. As the big guns from the warships pounded the beaches, landing craft moved forward toward the coastline, carrying the first of the 127,000 soldiers who would cross the beaches that day. Overhead, the largest air force ever assembled, 
nearly 5,000 planes of all types provided cover. It was a truly awesome display of the productivity of American, British and Canadian factories. It's like probably never to be seen again. Ten years later, when he was President of the United States, Eisenhower said that another overlord was impossible, because such a build-up of military strength on such a narrow front would be far too risky in the nuclear age. One or two atomic bombs would have wiped out the entire force. The invasion stretched for some 60 miles, from Sword Beach on the left to Utah Beach on the right. German resistance was spotty, almost non-existent at Utah Beach, quite effective and indeed almost decisive at Omaha Beach, determined but not irresistible at the British and Canadian beaches, where unusually high tides compressed the landings into narrow strips and added greatly to the problems of German artillery and small arms fire. Whatever the problems, except at Omaha, the invading forces overcame the initial opposition and a firm lodgment was made. On the far left, in the fighting closest to Howard and D Company, a bitter battle was underway in Wistraham. Progress toward Khan was delayed. Howard describes the invasion from D Company's point of view. The barrage coming in was quite terrific. It was as though you could feel the whole ground shaking toward the coast, and this was going on like hell. Soon afterward it seemed to get nearer, well, they were obviously lifting the barrage farther inland as our boats and craft came in, and it was very easy, standing there and hearing all this going on and seeing all the smoke over in that direction, to realise what exactly was happening and keeping our fingers crossed for those poor buggers coming by sea. I was very pleased to be where I was, not with the seaborne chaps. He quickly stopped indulging in sympathy for his seaborne comrades, because with full light, sniper activity picked up dramatically. Suddenly the easy movement back and forth over the bridge became highly dangerous. The general direction of the fire was coming from the west bank, toward Caen, where there was a heavily wooded area and two dominant buildings, the chateau that was used as a maternity hospital and the water tower. Where any specific sniper was located, D Company could not tell. But the snipers had the bridge under a tight control, if not a complete grip, and they were beginning to snipe the first aid post in its trench beside the road where Vaughan and his aides were wearing Red Cross bands and obviously tending wounded. David Wood, who was lying on a stretcher, three bullets in his leg, recalls that the first sniper bullet hit the ground a little distance from me and I thought that I was going to get it next. And then there was a shot which was far too close for comfort, thudded into the ground right next to my head and I looked up to see that my medical orderly had drawn his pistol to protect his patient and had accidentally discharged it and very nearly finished me off. Smith was having his wrist bandaged by another orderly. He relates, I was sitting in this ditch with my head above it, and he was doing my wrist, and then he stood up and one of the snipers shot him straight through the chest, knocked him absolutely miles backwards. The impact, you know. He went absolutely hurtling across the road, landed on his back screaming, Take my grenades out, take my grenades out. He was frightened of being shot again with grenades in his pouches. Someone got the grenades out and he survived, but Smith remembers the incident as a very low point in my life. I remember also I thought the next bullet was going to come for me. I felt terrible. Vaughan, bending over a patient, looked up in the direction of the sniper, shook his fist and declared, this isn't cricket. Later that morning, Wood and Smith were evacuated to a regimental aid post in Ranville, where they were also shot at and had to be moved again. Parr, Gardner, Gray and Bailey were in the gun pit, trying to figure out how the anti-tank gun worked. Howard had trained them on German small arms, mortars, machine guns and grenades, but not on artillery. We started figuring it out, Parr recalls, and we got the breach out, all the ammo you want downstairs, brought one shell up, put it in, closed the breach. Now how do you fire it? All right, it's got a telescopic sight on it. It's got a range chart on the side with various points along the canal bank sighted in, one thing and another. The four soldiers were standing in the gun pit. Because of its camouflage, the snipers could not get at them. They talked it over, trying to locate the firing mechanism. Pa continues. Charlie Gardner said, what's this? It was a push button. He just pushed it, and there was the biggest explosion. The shell screamed off in the general direction of Car, and of course, the case shot out of the back, and if anybody had stood there, it would have caved their ribs in. That's how we learned to fire the after that, Pa gleefully admits. 
I had the time of my life firing that gun. He and his mates were certain that the sniping was coming from the roof of the chateau. Pa began putting shells through the top floor of the building, spacing them along. There was no discernible decrease in the volume of sniper fire, however, and the sniper's locations remain, 40 years later, a mystery. Pa kept shooting. Jack Bailey tired of the sport and went below to brew up his first cup of tea of the day. Every time Pa fired, the chamber filled with dust and smoke, and loose sand came shaking down. Bailey called up, Now, Wally, no firing now, just give me three minutes. Bailey took out his Tommy cooker, lit it, watched as the water came to a boil, shivered with pleasure as he thought how good that tea was going to taste, had his sugar ready to pop into it, when suddenly, blam! Wally had fired again. Dust, soot and sand filled Bailey's mug of tea, and his Tommy cooker was out. Bailey, certain Wally had timed it deliberately, came tearing up, looking, according to Pa, like a bloody lunatic. Bailey threatened Pa with immediate dismemberment, but at heart Bailey was a gentle man, and by keeping the gun between himself and Bailey, Pa survived. Howard dashed across the road, bending low, to find out what Pa was doing. When he realised that Pa was shooting at the chateau, he was horrified. Howard ordered Pa to cease fire immediately, then explained to him that the chateau was a maternity hospital. So, Pa says today with a touch of chagrin, that was the first and only time I've ever shelled pregnant women and newborn babies. Howard never did convince Pa that the Germans were not using the roof for sniping. As Howard returned to his CP, he called out, Now you keep that bloody so-and-so quiet, Pa. Just keep it quiet. Yes, sir. Only fire when necessary, and that doesn't mean at imaginary snipers. Yes, sir. Soon Pa was shooting into the trees. Howard yelled, For Christ's sake, Pa, will you shut up? Will you keep that bloody gun quiet? I can't think over it. Well... Pa thought to himself. Nobody told me it was going to be a quiet war. But he and his mates stopped firing and started cleaning up the shell casings scattered through the gun pit. It had suddenly occurred to them that if someone slipped on a casing while he was carrying a shell, and if the shell fell point downward into the brimful ammunition room, they and their gun and the bridge itself would all go sky high. By 7am the British 3rd Division was landing at Sword Beach, and the big naval gunfire had lifted to start pounding Kion, en route passing over D Company's position. They sounded so big, Howard says, and being poor bloody infantry, we had never been under naval fire before, and these damn great shells came sailing over, such a size that you automatically ducked, even in the pillbox, as one went over, and my radio operator was standing next to me, very perturbed about this, and finally Corporal Tappenden said, Blimey, sir, they're firing jeeps. Sandy Smith's platoon brought in two prisoners, described by Howard as miserable little men in civilian clothes, scantily dressed, very hungry. They were Italians, slave labourers in the TOT organisation. Long, complicated sign language communication finally revealed that they were the labourers who were designated to put the anti-glider poles in place. They had been doing their job on Woolworks LZ when they were rounded up. They appeared quite harmless to Howard, he gave them some dry biscuits from his 48-hour ration pack, then told Smith to let them loose. The Italians, Howard relates, immediately went off toward the LZ, where they proceeded in putting up the poles. You can just imagine the laughter that was caused all the way around to see these silly buggers putting up the poles. More questioning then revealed that the Italians were under the strictest orders from the TOT organisation to have those poles in the ground by twilight, June 6th. They were sure the Germans would be back to check on their work, and if it were not done, they were in for the bloody high jump, so they'd better get on with it, and surrounded by our laughter, they got on with it, putting in the poles. At about 8am, Spitfires flew over, very high, at 6,000 or 7,000 feet. Howard put out a ground-to-air signal, using purposely made signs spread over the ground that meant, we're in charge here and everything's all right. Three Spitfires, like every other airship, including the gliders that participated in the invasion, wearing three white bars on each wing, peeled off, dove to 1,000 feet, and circled the bridges, doing victory roll after victory roll. As they pulled away, one of them dropped an object. Howard thought the pilot had jettisoned his reserve petrol tank, 
but he sent a reconnaissance patrol to find out what it was. The patrol came back, and to our great surprise and amusement, it was the early additions from Fleet Street. There was a scramble for them amongst all the troops, especially for the Daily Mirror, which had a cartoon strip called Jane, and they were all scuffing for Jane. There were one or two moans about there being no mention of the invasion or of D Company at all. Throughout the morning, all movement in D Company's area was done crouched over at a full sprint. Then, shortly after 9am, Howard had the wonderful sight of three tall figures walking down the road. Now, between the bridges, you were generally out of line of snipers, because of the trees along the east side of the canal, and these three tall figures came marching down very smartly, and they turned out to be General Gale, about six feet five inches, flanked by two six-foot brigadiers, Kindersley on one side, our own air landing brigade commander, and Nigel Poet, commanding the 5th Para Brigade on the other. And it really was a wonderful sight, because they were turned out very, very smartly, wearing berets and in battle dress, and marching in step down the road. It was a pure inspiration to all my chaps, seeing them coming down. Richard Todd said that, for sheer bravado and bravery, it was one of the most memorable sights I've ever seen. Gale had come down by glider about 3 a.m. and established his headquarters in Ranville. He and his brigadiers were on their way to consult with Pine Coffin, whose 7th Battalion was hotly engaged with enemy patrols in Benouville and Lepore. Gale called out to D Company as he marched along, Good show, chaps. After a briefing from Howard, Gale and his companions marched across the bridge. They were shot at, but were not hit and never flinched. As they disappeared into Pine Coffin's headquarters, two gunboats suddenly appeared, coming up from the coast headed toward Cal. They were coming from the small harbour in Wistraham, which was under attack by elements of Lord Lovat's commando brigade. The gunboats were obviously aware that the bridge was in unfriendly hands, because the lead boat came on at a steady speed, firing its 20mm cannon at the bridge. Pa could not shoot back with the anti-tank gun, because the bridge and its superstructure blocked his field of fire. Corporal Godbolt, commanding Hash 2 platoon, was on the bank with a piat. Howard ordered his men to hold fire until the first gunboat was in Godbolt's range. Then some of the seventh paras on the other side started firing at the boat, and Godbolt let go at maximum range, and to his amazement he saw the piat bomb explode inside the wheelhouse. The gunboat turned sideways, the bow plunged into the parabank, the stern jammed against D Company's side of the canal. Germans started running off the stern, hands high, shouting, Kamerad! Kamerad! The captain, dazed but defiant, had to be forced off the boat. Howard remembers him as an 18 or 19-year-old Nazi, very tall, spoke good English. He was ranting on in English about what a stupid thing it was for us to think of invading the continent, and when his Führer got to hear about it that we would be driven back into the sea, and making the most insulting remarks, and I had the greatest difficulty stopping my chaps from getting hold and lynching that bastard on the spot. But Howard knew that intelligence would want to see the officer immediately, so he had the prisoner marched off toward the prisoner of war cage in Ranville, and he had to be frog-marched because he was so truculent and shouting away all through the time. The sappers poured over the boat, examining the equipment, looking for ammunition and guns. One of them found a bottle of brandy and stuck it in his battle smock. His commander, Jock Nielsen, noticed the bulge. Hey, what have you got there? The sapper showed him the brandy. Nielsen straight away took it, saying, You are not old enough for that. The sapper complains, I never saw a drop of that bloody brandy. D Company had now fired its much maligned Piat guns twice. One shot had knocked out a tank and sent a second tank scurrying, the second shot had knocked out a gunboat and forced a second one to turn tail and run. D Company had now captured two bridges, the ground between them and one gunboat. Near Caen, von Luck was close to despair. The naval bombardment raining down on Caen was much the most tremendous he had seen in all his years at war. Although his assembly point was camouflaged and so far untouched, he knew that when he started to move, when he finally got the order to go, he would be spotted immediately by the Allied reconnaissance aircraft overhead, his position reported to the big ships out in the channel, and a torrent of 12-inch and 16-inch shells would come down on his head. Under the circumstances, 
He doubted that he could get through the 6th Airborne and recapture the bridges. His superiors agreed with him, and they decided that they would destroy the bridges and thus isolate the 6th Airborne. They began to organise a gunboat packed with infantry, meanwhile sending out frogmen and a fighter bomber from Cayenne to destroy the bridges. At about 10am, the German fighter bomber came flying directly out of the sun, over the river bridge, skimming along just above the trees lining the road, obviously headed for the canal bridge. Howard dived into his pillbox. His men dived into trenches. They poked their heads out to watch as the pilot dropped his bomb. It was a direct hit on the bridge tower, but it did not explode. Instead, it clanged onto the bridge and then dropped into the canal. It was a dud. The dent is there on the bridge to this day. Howard's comment is, what a bit of luck that was, which says the least of it. Howard adds, with professional approval, and what a wonderful shot it was by that German pilot. The two frogmen were, in the daylight, easily disposed of by riflemen along the banks of the canal. On the ground, however, the Germans were pushing the British back. Nigel Taylor's was the only company of 7th Battalion in Benouville. It was desperately under strength and very hard pressed by the increasingly powerful German counterattacks. The two companies in Lepore were similarly situated, and like Taylor were having to give up some ground. As the Germans moved forward, they began putting some of their SPVs into action. These vehicles belonged to von Luck's regiment, but were attached to forward companies that were expected to act on their own initiative, rather than report back to the regimental assembly area. The British called the rocket launchers on the SPVs moaning minis. The thing we most remember about them, Howard says, apart from the frightful noise which automatically made you dive for cover, but the thing we most noticed was the tremendous accuracy. Between explosions, Wally Parr dashed across the road to see Howard. I got a feeling, he panted, that there is somebody up there on that water tower spotting for the minis. He explained that the water tower, located near the maternity hospital, had a ladder up to the top and that he could see something up there. Wouldn't Howard please give him permission to have a go at it? Howard agreed. And you couldn't see Wally's ass for dust, he recalls, as Pa dashed back across the road to his gun. Pa bellowed out, Number one gun! As he did so, there was one of those strange lulls that occur in so many battles. In the silence, Pa's great cockney voice carried across the battlefield, from Lepore to Benouville, from the canal to the river. Now, as Howard points out, there was only one gun. As Pa rejoins, it was the only gun in the entire 6th Airborne Division at that moment, so it really was the number one gun. Pa then put his crew through a drill that constituted a proper artilleryman's fire order. 700, one round, right five degrees, and so on, all orders preceded by number one gun. Finally, prepare to fire. All around him, the warriors, German as well as British, were fascinated spectators. Fire! The gun roared, the shell hurtled off. It hit the water tower head on. Great cheers went up all around. Berets were tossed into the air. Men shook hands joyfully. The only trouble was, the ammunition was armour piercing. The shell went in one side and came out the other without exploding. Streams of water began running out the holes, but the structure was still solid. Pa blasted away again and again, until he had the tower spurting water in every direction. Howard finally ordered him to quit. When Gale, Kindersley and Poet returned from their conference with Pine Coffin, they told Howard that one of his platoons would have to move up into Benouville and take a position in the line beside Taylor's company. Howard chose Hash 1 platoon. He also sent Sweeney and Fox with their platoons over to the west side to take a position across from the Gondre Café where they should hold themselves ready to counter-attack in the event of a German breakthrough. And we thought, Sweeney says, that this was a little bit unfair. We'd had our battle throughout the night. The 7th Battalion had come in and taken over the position, and we rather felt that we should be left alone for a little bit, and that the 7th should not be calling on our platoons to come help it out. Sweeney and Fox settled down by a hedge. Back at Tarrant Rushton a week earlier, Sweeney and Richard Todd had met because of a confusion in their names. In the British Army, all Sweeney's were nicknamed Todd, and all Todd's were known as Sweeney, after the famous barber in London, Sweeney Todd. On the occasion of their meeting, Sweeney and Todd laughed about the coincidence. 
Todd's parting words had been, see you on D-Day. On the outskirts of Lepore, at 11am on D-Day, as Sweeney rested against the hedge, a face appeared through the bushes, and Richard Todd said to me, I said I'd see you on D-Day, and disappeared again. Over in Benouville, Hash One Platoon was hotly engaged in street fighting. The platoon had gone through endless hours of practice in street fighting, in London, Southampton and elsewhere, and had gained experience during the night at the fighting around the cafe. Now it gave Taylor's company a much-needed boost as it started driving Germans out of buildings they had recaptured. Sergeant Joe Kane was in command. He was a phlegmatic sort of a character, Bailey remembers. Nothing seemed to perturb him. They saw an outhouse in a small field. Cover me, Kane said to Bailey. Keep me covered. I'm going to take a crap. He dashed off to the outhouse. A minute later, he dashed back. I can't face that, Kane confessed. There was no hole in the ground, only a bucket and nothing to sit on. The bucket looked as if it had not been emptied in days. It was overflowing. I can't face that, Kane repeated. Thirty-four years later, Bailey induced Kane to return to Normandy. Bailey had been back often through the years, but this was Kane's initial visit since the war. The first thing Kane wanted to do was to go to that outhouse to see if the bucket had been emptied out yet. But it was gone. By about midday, most of the 7th Battalion had reported in for duty, some coming singly, some in small groups. Enough arrived so that Pine Coffin could release Howard's platoons. Howard brought them back to the area between the bridges. The snipers remained active. Sporadically, the moaning minis continued to come in. Battles were raging in Benouville, Le Port, and to the east of Ranville. D Company was shooting back at the snipers, but as Billy Gray confesses, we couldn't see them, we were just guessing. But limited though D Company's control was, it held the bridges.